Ever wanted to put yourself or one of your characters in a video game? Donate to the Terrain of Magical Expertise Kickstarter and you could be a background character or even a fully animated enemy in this brand new RPG adventure. Click the link in the description below or at the end of the video. J J J C C do 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 J J J C C Yeah Carter Cathcart his talents off the chart I had to get him for a curb log I do confess he's a really good guest Oh Carter Cathcart Yeah now we're gonna start Oh my 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 curb blog for Voice October Welcome everybody <laughs> I had to I had to dig to find that reference <laughs> Welcome, everybody, to Voice October 20, uh, 2017. That's a, I, I can speak. I do it for a living sometimes. Where I interview various veterans of the voiceover world. This week's guest is one I'm very happy to have. Uh, he was one I was hoping for last year, but things got a little crazy and busy. This year, I am finally joined by a gentleman who's been doing this for a long, long, long time. You may know him best for... Uh, characters such as Weevil Underwood from the original Yu-Gi-Oh! series, Mino on Ping Pong Club. Uh, he was once Vector the Crocodile on Sonic. In fact, he was the, originer, the originator of the Find the Computer Room performance. Uh, but the big, big one, of course, is that uh, he's not only the voice of a countless amount of uh, Pokemon characters, uh, but he is the single longest-running cast member, if I'm not mistaken, uh, of the entire anime series since its premiere in the U.S. in 98. Uh, he was in the very first episode as Gary Oak, and in the last decade or so, he's also been uh, Professor Oak and James and Meowth of Team Rocket, and has also been the longest-running, I believe, uh, scriptwriter for the English dub as well. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome James Carter Cathcart. How you doing, sir? It's a pleasure to speak with you, whippersnapper. <laughs> I tell you, I love being a veteran. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I, I didn't want to, I didn't want to out yourself too hard, but it's like, yeah, I mean, 20, 20 years on a single show, and you've been doing stuff for way longer than that, too, <laughs> so. Well, I do have, you know, very vivid memories of the very first episode, which was 20 years ago, and I remember being at Button Sound, and Mike Hegney was, was adapting the script, and he was also directing, and so we were just kind of all meeting each other, and really knew little about Pokemon at all. I, I knew it was running at 6.30 in the morning. I remember going in, and it was like, studio was freezing, and, uh, but I knew that Gary was the right guy to do because he was such a brat, so I felt right <laughs> at home dealing with him, you know. Yeah, and, and sa sadly, I, I, I've missed his presence on the show, uh, but you've been in virtually every episode, if not as <laughs> Team Rocket, as, as some Pokemon or some buddy, and uh, yeah, tw 20 years already is, is insane to me because I still remember uh, watching that, but before we get to... Uh, Pokemon. I, so, Carter, you don't do a whole lot of like. I, I know you do conventions here and there, and and but I, I I've not found a whole lot of interviews with you. So normally, I I like to often skip the like kind of generic stuff of like how did you get started. But like I don't know your story, and I'm really <laughs> curious to know it because you as as far as I know, I think you were in like the very first wave of VO guys in New York. Uh, you know, let alone doing anime, but just anything. Uh, so let's let's go way back. Uh, t tell us, tell us your beginnings in this this wacky ass world of cartoons. Well, I'm a, you know born and raised a musician. Started playing piano at the age of five. Um, I came to New York when I was 19, and I was playing in bands. And uh, I mean, there's a lot of history back there. Obviously, when you around a long time, you do generate a lot of history. And so, uh, at, at, by 19. 78, I was in a band called The Laughing Dogs, and we were on the Live at CBGB's album, and we had two albums out on Columbia, and that uh, took me into the 80s, where I set up a recording studio and started producing and writing and working with anybody and everybody that I could, met a lot of great people in the 80s, and then I started working with a guy who was the director for the new opening for a show called the ABC Weekend Special, and that ran on Saturday afternoons, and it was like a live action. It was like an after-school special, but this was called the ABC Weekend Special. Mm -hmm. So we, I was doing the music for the, the theme package for the whole show, and I think this was 91, and they came to me towards the end of the project uh, because the host of the show was a cartoon cat named O.G. Reedmore. 
and they already had a voice for the for the OG Reborn, but the voice, they really didn't like the current voice that they had, and of course they had no money, and blah, 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 and did I know anybody that could do the voice, and yeah, I've been doing voices, I'm sure, just like you, my whole life, just making a fool of myself for, for fun, and I said, of course I know who could do that, it would be me, so I, that was my first I kind of backed into my first voice job being the voice of O.G. Readmore. And the great thing about that was he ended up being uh, the spokes cat for Project Literacy, which was huge. ABC was really pushing to get kids to read. And so O.G. Readmore, duh, that's what that was. The, so I would walk into like when I had to, to go to the library with my kids because they were like, and 19, well, they weren't born until 93, but I, but he was, you'd go walk into a library and there'd be a, a life-size cartoon, a cardboard cutout of O.G. Readmore telling kids to read. And so I was doing all these PSAs for ABC, and it was it was a ton of fun. And then little by little, more um, uh, uh, other cartoon projects and, and voiceover projects. I, I did a, a couple of Kit Kat commercials for Give Me a Break, Give Me a Break. And that was a lot of fun, and I was singing a lot of jingles. Back then, there was a huge jingle uh, in the 90s, um, singing a lot of Coors Light Spots, and it was it was a ton of fun. And then all of a sudden, in the 97, we heard about this show um, that nobody knew anything about, but they had cute little critters on it named Pokemon. And the only fact that I had been told about the show was some poor Japanese soul had had an epileptic fit because apparently there was a strobe sequence that set off something and this poor guy was watching the show. And that's the only thing we knew about it. So um, when we started recording in that first episode, I thought it was hilarious. I loved Michael's uh, writing and, and, and Gary was just a snot. So it was a, <laughs> Like, you know, within a few months, it it was obvious that something was going on with the show. And then, as we know, that first year uh, was like Beatlemania. I mean, I, I any money that I made off the show, I probably just used it to buy Pokemon cards for my son, <laughs> who was four years old at the time, and, and had, had not quite gotten the concept. Like, we watched the show, and Gary would be on it, and I'd say to my son, I'd say, CJ, that's me. And he'd be like, no, Daddy. You're you. That's Gary. So, <laughs> right on the line of, of, of the concept that, you know, I was actually doing the voice. And, and then he had all these uh, friends in preschool and kindergarten. And, and so I'd pick him up from school and take him to school. And I would talk to his friends. And I'd say, yeah, I'm the voice of Gary Oak. And I would do the voice. And all they would say is, yeah, right. So nobody <laughs> ever believed me. None of those kids ever believed me. But, yeah, the show's been going on. And we're, we're at season 20 now. And it's just... Um, it seems that uh, Pokemon Go has really uh, given the whole thing a, a real shot in the arm because I know all sorts of kids that love playing that thing. And um, sometimes I'll come up behind them and, you know, do a couple of voices to ask if they caught me yet. But <laughs> they turn around and, of course, they think I'm crazy, which Someday. I am. <laughs> well, aren't we all? You have to be to be in this business. Um, yes. so, so even like, this is the funny thing is I'm, I'm going back and I'm finding, um, you know, now in my adulthood, a lot of these classic anime, uh, from like when like Central Park media was even a thing and, and like some of the early media blasters days and a lot of that stuff, there are all these other classic anime with like a lot of like you guys, all, all of the, the, I mean, what, what the internet seems to think is just like the 10 guys that did everything at four kids for a long time. But you know, that wasn't exactly the case um but like all of you guys uh were in all these other shows even like before pokemon um right and so so like i i know a lot of folks i think uh mike pollock and like dan green a lot of folks always attribute a lot to um tony salerno as one of the early kind of like guys in the anime scene that was like directing and engineering and stuff um but so what was when when anime in general even before pokemon um, what was uh, what was that kind of like for like the world of uh, you know the actors in New York of like oh this is also a thing that we're doing like in between I guess off Broadway or music or TV and stuff and it's just like oh what's this Japan animation stuff like what was that kind of early period like for you guys? Well, I tell you, I'm, I I rarely think about it that way. I do know that uh, Central Park Media, where where um, uh, a lot of these shows like Slayers and Revolutionary Girl Utena, um, there was a, a core bunch of people. And 
I'm not sure any of us are really thinking about other than go in and and just work on all these shows. Like Uten is a, is a prime example of of really that. Even even though I think you know I did a good job on the show and it was great, I still don't know what that show's about. <laughs> and so we, you know, you go in and you're and you're basically, as you know, you're dealing with the section that you're involved in. So you're really not looking at the whole thing while you're recording. So. Um, at the end, I remember at the end of whatever did we do two seasons or or three seasons? They wanted to do a, a kind of a video sitting around talking about the show, and so I said, "Yeah, I'm happy to do it, but I don't know what it's about." So, uh, but I was Mickey. Mickey, I can't remember Mickey's last name, but he was a very sensitive, blue-haired pianist who had a sister who was in love with him, and it was a very strange show. But yeah. but it was a great time, and then. You know, I learn more from fans than I know. Like, if I want to know what I did back then, I just have to go on a WikiLeaks, not WikiLeaks, but a page, and and people know all of these different things that I did, because we were just kind of running around like headless chickens, just doing all these different shows. And then, of course, when four kids started going, and then they had four kids uh, Saturday morning, they had four hours of programming, so there were eight shows going every week. And it was crazy. There were six recording studios, and then for a while we were working at Taj as well, and we'd just kind of run around. And uh, there was a show called Cubics, Robots for Everyone, and uh, Ultraman Tiga, and uh, Yu-Gi-Oh! And so it would just be like from two to four, you're in this studio, and from four to six, you're in this studio. And we just kind of ran around and and went crazy, but there were a lot of shows. I tell you, my favorite show back there, and I might have told you this already, there was a 26-episode thing called The Ping Pong Club, and that oh, had yeah. all of the guys that were in <laughs> all of the other shows, and girls, in this show. But I I was the main character, Maeno, and, and Tony was directing, and there was no limit. I mean, there was only one word that we could not say, and we could rewrite anything we wanted, and it was hilarious. And the word we couldn't say, obviously I can't say here, but just think of the dirtiest word you can imagine. That was the only thing we couldn't say. So it was just like, cart- and we had a ball. And Tony was a great director and still is. And um, and that's where I used to run into, you know, Vidi and, and Dan and, and a lot of those different people. Veronica, geez, we were all doing those shows. I, I have uh, also, yeah, I've, I've discovered some clips of Ping Pong Club. That is some great stuff. If any of you guys out there have never seen the anime Ping Pong Club, it is a treat, and especially if you grow if you grew up with Pokemon and Yu-Gi-Oh, it, it's mildly childhood destroying because you're hearing like all of the voices of the the characters you grew up with on Saturday morning, you know, toy driven anime shows, uh, saying just the most gross things in, in imagination. But my God, it's hilarious. <laughs> Yeah, they, they've always referred to it. At least I heard somebody refer, uh, refer to it as like the the anime version of South Park. But it was a bunch of eighth grade kids, and the boys, had, you know, they had a ping pong club. And of course, what did they? What does any eighth grade boy think about? Usually, it's not ping pong, but it's girls. <laughs> so it was just it was crazy. And I always wished that there had been more episodes because that was truly not working. That was just going in and having a ball. We just had a blast. <laughs> the whole time. So and it's on YouTube if you want to check out. There's a couple of episodes up there. And some people, you know, raise an eyebrow or two. But, hey, it's a cartoon, you know? <laughs> I, I, uh, I, I can't imagine, like, you go, you go from, like, oh, and today I'm doing a, a Kit Kat jingle, which I remember hearing about that a while ago, and that, that's, that must have been a nice payday. Uh, and, and even, I mean, like, yeah, like in, in the heyday of, like, of when there were like eight billion shows happening in New York, like yeah, you might you guys must have been like doing amazingly at that point because yeah, it's like literally like almost every show on uh, on on you know the Fox Box and then Four Kids TV and you know you had Pokemon Yu Gi Oh and WB. It's like you guys were everywhere, like all over Saturday morning. Um, but so it, but it, it wasn't. Did it go from like? wow, this is weird, like, this is just another job, like, in between other stuff, to, like, oh, now this is this is the thing, this is what we're doing, is voiceover all the time, like, in animation, like, was it, was it like, a strange transition, or, like, did you guys kind of, or did, did you, anyway, I know you can't speak for anybody else, but, like, did you like going into just, like, well, this is, this is what I'm doing now? <laughs> yeah, 
it was fine. I was I was happy because I knew that there was not going to be a dull moment ever because you went in every day not having any idea what you were going to do, not seeing the scripts. The first five, I started adapting the scripts for Pokemon for uh, season five. So the you know the first four years you just go in and you just read it cold. And uh, by the way, Gary is still you know he's around. It's just that. He's a Pokemon researcher, and I think the last time he was on um, an episode was season 13 or 14, and he and Ash are friends, and, and Gary's kind of grown up, and he's nice now, so you don't see him much, but he, you know, you never know. You never know with that show what's going to happen, so I, I hope Gary uh, reappears sometimes, because when I do cons, and I've done, this year I've actually done uh Several, which is unusual for me because I usually don't have any time to do any of that stuff. But we went to SunnyCon in uh, Newcastle, England. Michelle and I went. Michelle Knotts, who voices uh, Jesse, and Michelle's boyfriend, Chris Smith, who kind of is the agent. Um, actually, I lost my train of thought. Oh, but we did go to the SunnyCon. Pe- pe- people, people being like, dude, Gary, oh my God, right? That's right. Yeah, that, and, and going to England was so great because they, they were so nice and, and uh, grateful, you know, and they had all grown up with the show. But Gary is, is uh, the one that really, like, they got to be diehard fans because they all, they, <laughs> they kept coming up and going, no, 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 but you're Gary. You, no, you don't understand. You're Gary. And I'm like, it's great. Thank you so much. And I'm so grateful. <laughs> <laughs> that they appreciate all that stuff because you know we had a ball. But as you know, as well as anybody, when you're sitting in that little tiny room and there's a director there, you kind of forget that there are going to be people looking at this later. Um, so going to a con and, and being able to hear such nice words coming from from so many people is just it's really gratifying. I love it. Yeah, no, I mean, like, I uh, we we had the pleasure of doing YomaCon together a number of years ago now, and uh, I remember. We uh, your your panel where you were playing piano as well was awesome, uh, oh. and you were you were so entertaining to everybody. It was it was truly a pleasure for that. I would say. <laughs> um, the I, thing I remember most about Yomacon was I, I mean, was the sheer number of people there. Um, I remember that there would I believe there was a bank of eight elevators at the Renaissance Center yeah, where we all yeah yeah yeah, yeah. but just to upstairs to your room would take almost an hour because there was a line of millions of kids just all trying to use the elevators at the same time. So, uh, and there was one, there was one day, I think it was the second Yomacon where there was a kid, um, in front of me who was dressed like Carnivine. And obviously he put, and probably his parents along with him, had put all this effort in making this fantastic Carnivine costume. And, you know, Carnivine kind of looks like a green, kind of a moldy Mayor McCheese for McDonald's. <laughs> it's got that big mouth. So the, you could see that he was looking out of Carnivine's mouth. You could see his eyes. So I was staying right behind him, and I do the voice of, of Carnivine. So I jumped in front of him, and I went, Carnivine! And... The poor kid started crying. He was really little, and I didn't mean to scare him, and I spent the rest of the time apologizing, but it was a great memory. Though. That, was, that, was, that was crazy, that, that convention. You know? yeah, no, that, that, was, that was a fun one. Yeah, yeah. Um, oh, my God. Uh, I'm trying to think of even... I'm, I'm losing my train of thought already. Uh, <laughs> so... <laughs> um, well, I, I guess, you know, obviously you've been, you've been like, a, a core member of the show for like over 10 years now I, obviously you stayed with the show uh you're one of the couple people that stayed with the show when uh, there was the 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 cast switch uh number of years ago now of course you guys have been doing it for even longer than than the four kids era um what what is it but between like writing the show and like being on the show as you know two major characters that are almost in every single episode, as, as far as I'm aware, I've, I'm a little behind on Sun and Moon. Sadly, I, 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 I hate to admit, but I, I have been enjoying it greatly. And I just binged uh, all of X and Y uh, last year because it's on Netflix and adored that series very much. You guys did a great job on that one. But what what is a uh, what what is a a day in the life of Carter Cathcart like? just in general these days, like po- Pokemon and otherwise, I would say. Well, I, I spend, and I, this is, you know, I make myself do this. I, I, I practice a lot of piano, and 
I've been writing a lot of songs and playing a lot of guitar and, and the script adapting gig really makes that possible because I originally started um, doing that when Michael Hegney went on to do, uh, I can't think of the name of the Kirby. He started doing Kirby. So he was writing that for four kids and uh, four kids had been looking for a, an adapter or writer or whatever for Pokemon, and I, they weren't having any luck. They were bringing in writers from L.A., and, and, and no, you know, it's like they didn't quite get the sense of humor or whatever. And I was, at that time, a, a single parent. I had, uh, I still do, have my two kids, C.J. and Mackenzie. At that time, they were eight and seven years old, and I needed to be home. And so, you know, having agents and, and doing voice work and going in for auditions all of a sudden got much more difficult. So, and I love to write, but I had not done it before. And I just pleaded with four kids. I said, just give me a chance. Let me try. And I think I wrote four or five scripts and they finally said, okay, fine. And so I've been doing it ever since. And it kind of started though, just practically speaking, I needed to be home. I needed to be able to get my kids up. And, you know, send, uh, drive them to school and pick them up and do their homework with them. And so in between, I would write, and I've been writing ever since. So I've been writing now for close to 16 years. The script writing by far takes the most time. Um, it definitely takes a good portion of, of every day, you mm -hmm. know. Uh, but I think I've written. I mean, I look back. I mean, if it, I don't know if there's an average of like 48 episodes in a season. I've been doing it for 15 seasons. That's that's a lot of, like, we're blasting off again. A lot of Team oh, yeah. Rocket gags. <laughs> yeah, and, I, and who'd have thought eventually you, you'd, be doing, you'd be doing two of those uh, we're blasting off agains overlaid on top of each other in time. Um, Definitely it's a, a dream come true. I mean, right now the most fun thing is when you get an episode that uh, obviously Team Rocket's going to have gags uh, like crazy. To be able to go in and voice the gags after I've written them is you know, I still kind of pinch myself. And, and <laughs> um, season five, that was like, uh, I think that was the still the Johto stuff. Um, I believe. So. Yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> I, 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 I did remember you had been doing it for, uh, like, like b before, uh, uh, before like, well, during the Four Kids era, but I'd forgotten even, like, how early it was. Yeah, 15 years. That is, like, oh, I think we're, we're approaching, like, close to 1,000 episodes of the show already, I think. Uh, like that, they're just, that, that's like, that's like something on the level of like a Simpsons or like a, you know, like a family guy, like that kind of show. Like there's very few shows in the world that have that kind of bragging right to it, you know? Um, well, it's really fun to go to a con again. I'll, I'll mention the sunny con thing because there's so many different ages and, and, uh, you know, there, there were kids, I use the word loosely in their, you know, late twenties that were big Pokemon fans, and then all the way down to kids that are five and six years old. And, and you, it just runs the gamut. And, and also then you get families um, where the, they'll, uh, the, you know, they'll have a little kid who loves Pokemon, but they grew up, the parents grew up with Pokemon too. So it's just, it's surreal to talk to all of those people. <laughs> multi, multi I mean, it's funny because there's now, I think, seven generations of Pokemon games and there's multiple generations of people who have grown up with everything. Right. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, it's crazy too because even like, um, you know, I, I've, I'm 28 and I've got uh, a lot of friends around my age that, that still love the series and they, they mostly play the games. And even what I try to do is I'm like, no, you got to check out the show too. Like I, I tell them all the time, like, Please, like, watch X and Y. Like, it, it's the best the show's been. Like, I, and I say that as someone who grew up with, you know, the the original seasons, and a lot of people I know who are like, oh, I stopped watching the show like since Misty was around, and I'm like, no, like, you gotta check out like how it is now. And th and then, you know, for the people that I've convinced, then they, you know, now they're into Sun and Moon, and they love like the awesome looking animation style and all that, and like all these new characters and stuff. So it's crazy to see, you know, because like, and it's funny because you were talking about Pokemon Go earlier. Like, I think that that game definitely brought the um, the mainstream eye back on Pokemon again. But at the same time, like, it, it like for all this time, for twenty years, it still had even during its like, you know, not taking over the universe period. It still has like as much staying power as you know, any other uh, major long-running cartoon. I think even Pikachu is, like, more recognizable around the world than, like, Bugs Bunny might be, which is surreal as hell. Um, well, that's true, and that's usually the character when you speak to people that, you know, because there's certainly people that don't know anything about Pokemon, and if, and if you're kind of 
dabbling in it, like it can just seem like total gobbledygook chaos if you don't really have some clue as to what's going on. But yeah, that's the first thing they'll mention is, is Pikachu. It's like everybody knows about Pikachu. And a lot of people know about Meowth, too, which, which I'm thrilled, you know. Of course. Well, I mean, yeah, especially the old school fans in particular love Meowth because he's just the most consistent, you know, source of comedy <laughs> all throughout. Um, yeah. I, I, I guess kind of also talking about this, too, I'm thinking about it. Uh, one of the things that I was growing to love uh, when I first got on the show, uh, I had my, my brief little character in the Diamond and Pearl stuff, was... Uh, when the the show started doing like overarching like longer stories, you know, for a long time, obviously it was like you know you get the eight badges, you go to the 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 league at the end, you fight the guys, and then and then that's it, and then we go to the next one. But with uh, with these recent uh, several generations worth of the show since you've been on, they've been having all this like really in depth like heart pounding stuff that like they're expecting the kids to be following it uh, week to week and seeing where it's going. Um, right. has, has that been like, I mean, having been since, uh, the Johto era where it was a little bit more like episodic and gaggy, not that it's not individualized episodes, but like, has that been exciting for you as a writer to be like, Oh, like now there's like, like, and then no, oh, is this character going to come back? And like, are they going to be a bigger deal? Like in 20 episodes from now? And like, what's going to happen with this arc? Or like, is, is that cool? Like week to week to get, to be able to do that? Yeah, it is cool. And, and to tell you the truth, I'm, I'm pretty much you know, as much in the dark as to what's going to come up as anybody else. I mean, I find out when I'm actually writing something. So it, it's always, you know, uh, a surprise, no matter what's, what's happening. And, and it's also uh, because there's certain parts of the show, obviously, that are going to be similar. Like, you know, how many times does Team Rocket blow up and how many three one-liners do they have before they blast off again? That's a real challenge. I probably have come up with, 600 three one-liners before they all take off you know that that's a real challenge so it's different but it's the same and like as you said um season 20 the animation is just so different but it's so cute i just love it i just think everybody's adorable having uh having done so many and now also written for so many do you have any are there any particular other than the obvious like you know meowth james Professor Oak, Gary, other than the, than the, the main ones, of course, are there any other particular characters that like throughout 15 years worth that, uh, that you really enjoyed like working on or writing for or voicing any creatures, any humans, etc.? Well, my favorite Pokemon to voice is, was, uh, is Carnivine because he was such a sweetheart. And I'll say that and some people kind of give me a raised eyebrow because, you know, I did I voiced Turtwig and, and Munchlax, who I love too, but there was something about Carnivine that was very endearing. But I think my favorite character, and the one that seemed to develop in a kind of a, if I say Garyish way, that's kind of not true, but with an attitude was Bonnie and X and Y. I loved how Bonnie progressed. You know, she's cute as can be, but boy, as she went along, you know, she wasn't taking any BS from anybody. <laughs> and so she kind of ha- held it all together. And I, you know, I miss her. Bonnie's great. No, me too. Yeah. I mean, you know, certainly the, the, the sun and moon uh, classmates, uh, you know, I, I adore them as well. But yeah, like, Bonnie went down very quickly as one of my favorite uh, characters in the entire show. I mean, she, I, I would even, even on the comedy side, I would, I would put her... Uh, on par with Meowth, and even when they when they get to be in episodes, of, it was a Bonnie and Meowth episode one time. I remember was uh, one of my personal faves, so that that was a great one. Um, right, and Bonnie was always the one that whenever like Team Rocket would be in some sort of disguise, and Ash and everybody would be like, "Oh, hi, we've never met you before," and Bonnie would go, "Guys, can we grow up a little bit here?" <laughs> know who that is what is what do you need glasses what uh, i just love that she just kind of kept everybody you know from completely jumping off the um, cliff of, of not you know being clueless it was of great of course yeah uh, a, a big exciting thing happening soon of course in uh well this is going up in october uh in in uh, november early on we've got the 20th anniversary movie which i am very very excited about and uh, something I, I really got to commend you on, and actually I think I even gave you a compliment, a compliment about this a while back with that uh, the Charizard episode, the big uh, flashback one in black and white. Um, I, so I, I got to let you know something. 
when I was when I was a young lad, <laughs> sorry to date both of us here. Um, I used to watch like so many times. I remember in particular there was there was one year where my dad and I drove from New York to Florida to go to Disney World uh, one year, and we had we we rented a uh, like a mobile home or whatever to make the trip down there. And I had a VHS tape of the first three episodes of Pokemon that I must have watched. <laughs> Like an insane amount of time, and my my dad was wonderful in that. Like he got into Pokemon with me, and like he was he, we played the games together, and he was wonderful. You would you would love him if you ever met him. Uh, but oh. dear, but dear God, I I must have tortured him watching episodes one through three like eight thousand times on a multi day drive to Florida. <laughs> um, but that said, I I feel like I know episode one like, word for word by heart. And I remember when the, uh, just recently, at the time of recording this, the trailer uh, for Movie 20 just dropped. And, like, it opens up with with now you as Professor Oak. And line for line, I think I should warn you, there may be a problem with this. I'm like, this is episode one. This is, like, word for word. Like, the attention to detail is so good. So I, I wanted to say that and, and the, the big Charizard episode as well, like, you really did a great job on, uh, on, on keeping in tune with all that stuff. I gotta give, I gotta hand it to you on that. Well, thanks very much. I think we're all really excited, you know, because they're gonna, I, I believe that the movie 20 is gonna be in theaters for a few days, and so, you know, we got tickets and we're all gonna show and hang out. And of course, that reminds me, when the first movie came out 20 years ago, um, the premiere was at the Ziegfeld, I believe. Oh, yeah. And so, and then, again, my son was like four or five by then when the movie came out, and it was just a rush because we came up to the theater and the lines were all over the place, and then Veronica came running out and said, Get in here! And so she grabbed us and pulled it in. It was, it was, it was wonderful. I'm, I'm glad to see that uh, the movie's going to be um, in theaters for no matter. I'm not sure what the run is. It may be short, but whatever it is, it's, it's going to be sweet. Oh, yeah. No, I, I've already got my tickets. I'm going to go see it with a, a few of my buddies. And, uh, no, that's, that's going to be a good time for sure. Um, cool. I guess, uh, God, that, that's really all I, I, I wanted to ask. Uh, I guess we could start to wrap things up. Carter, is there anything – I mean, I'm sure a lot of people that watch this that haven't gotten the chance to meet you at cons or whatever, I'm sure, like – Weevil fans and ping pong club fans and po especially Pokemon fans, etc. You know, we'll have plenty of nice things to say in the comments. Uh, is there anything that you want to like say to any folks out there that? Or, or, or uh, I mean, I gotta say also. I mean, you know, for when when it was uh, it's time in New York. You know, Vector the Crocodile. <laughs> you ended up making <laughs> him into one of my favorite characters just because of his Pee Wee Herman ass like weird ah type of thing. <laughs> He was one of my favorites. Well, if memory serves, and it may not serve that well, but I believe that I did, and and this was not my idea. It just show, it turned out that way. I think I did Vector two different times and did two different voices. You did, in fact. Uh, but I yeah. could be wrong about that. But, no, but you, the one, you, were, you were correct. Yeah, the, the first one was a little more, it was kind of like your, uh, not Weevil, the other Yu-Gi-Oh guy. He was like the guy with the hood and the mask or whatever. I forget his name. Uh, I do <laughs> yeah, but he, he was it was like he was more kind of husky and then like when I think when four kids started doing the video games He came back and suddenly like oh hey shadow and I'm like whoa what happened? <laughs> you know the character I'm thinking about because actually And I can't think of it. Maybe you know the guy's name. It just escapes me now, but he was in um, I believe all the police Academy movies, you know, it, it, he was he was crazy uh, But I his when I saw Vector for some reason that second time, that voice of this guy that I'll probably remember at three in the morning and then jump up and scream it, but um, it was in my head in the same way that when I first saw the picture of Gary, um, I knew I didn't want to sound anything like the Japanese Gary, but I, I just kept looking at his pointy hair. So I figured, well, he should sound pointy because he looks pointy. <laughs> but these, these, it's funny when you look at a character and it's just a certain thing locks in your head, and as long as everybody else goes along with it, you know, you kind of have free reign to just come up with whatever you want. But uh, speaking of Weevil, the thing about Weevil that I remember the most was how much that ripped my throat to shreds. <laughs> <laughs> that was the hardest character I ever... As a matter of fact, I'm getting mucus just thinking about it. <laughs> well, now, uh, I, I don't know if you know, but uh, Billy Thompson, uh, who, of course, has been on many Pokemon characters, he's, uh, he's doing Weevil now, and I think there was some mobile game where they had a bunch of the characters, and uh, he's... <laughs> Doing his best you, as I can hear. 
Oh, that. Well, good for him. Yeah. That's great. It's funny. That's I, think a, yeah, it's, I, it's, I remember once I had a, Eric Stewart was directing at the time, and I had booked like a fool, a five hour session of Weevil. And I woke up the next day with 103 fever. I think I'd gotten a flu because my throat was so wrecked. Um, but a lot of a lot of people like that. They remember Weevil, and they had no idea that I did it originally. So that's always kind of fun. It's crazy. That also, now, now that I'm thinking about it, between Gary Weevil, uh, Meowth, and uh, oh god, what was another? One? Oh, and, and Mickey. Uh, it's funny that you 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 seem to have a penchant for playing. Uh, male characters in anime that also happen to be voiced by women in the Japanese version. <laughs> that's... You know, that's probably not that hard to do, though, because so many characters are voiced by women, especially young. You know, when you have young boys, it's um, it's not easy for for a guy to to sound like an authentic young boy. But but women seem to do it very well. So and evidently you, and you're also very good at playing women too, as I remember. <laughs> Well, I know my Aino dressed up as a woman several times in the ping pong club, and uh, I won't say any more about any of that. <laughs> Everybody, please, please do yourself a favor. Find ping pong club. Please go watch that. Um, that that's that's going to, I think, do it. Uh, Carter, do you got anything to, to plug or any last couple things you want to say to the listeners out there? Anything at all? Well, I just, you know, I've, since I started, I've done very few cons, but since I've started doing a few more, I've learned more about my career through fans than what I can remember, because we're talking 26, 27 years here that I've been doing this, so I want to thank uh, people that have communicated, everybody's really nice, and, and they offer me up information, and they'll say, I really thought it was great when you did blah, 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 and I'll go... I don't even remember, but then I'll start to think about it and do a little research, and and uh, it's really been helpful. So, if anything, thanks to everybody for for listening and responding and communicating and watching all this stuff. It's been it's great. Thank you. Nice. And uh, do you have any cons coming up at the moment, or not yet? Right now, the next con isn't for a few months because we did a quite a, a, quite a few, like I said, this last summer. But uh, we're going to be doing a Katora con in January in South Jersey. And, um, uh, right. So yeah, it, which is fine because right now the, uh, the script writing and everything is keeping me plenty, plenty busy, you know? And, yes. and when you do a con, especially when it's a three day con, you, it's almost like you get home and you need at least three days just to do nothing, but that never happens. I'm always <laughs> back on a Sunday and then having to go to uh, do art on a Monday. So, so, you know, I just, I keep the appearances, uh, not too many of them, that's, that's all. But I sure love doing them when I do them. And I play music there, and I'm able to play some piano and just talk about stuff. and It's lovely. Nice. Well, hey, thank you so much for taking the time to do this. This was awesome. And, oh, uh, great. Thanks, Chris. Oh, of course, yeah. And uh, I guess to everybody else out there, uh, well, first of all, uh, please be sure to check out Pokemon the Movie 20, I Choose You, uh, in theaters early November. Uh, you get your tickets. I'm, I'm going to see it. Uh, and also, of course, check out Pokemon Sun and Moon uh, Saturday mornings, Cartoon Network, still growing strong. It's awesome. And uh, I guess in the comments below, leave any thoughts or feedback or fond memories of any of Carter's characters that you grew up with back in the day on many Saturday morning shows, etc. And also, check out uh, not only Ping Pong Club, go look up uh, Carter's music, because I, uh, in, in doing my little intro this morning, uh, I was uh, going back and listening to some of his music for the first time in many years, and it's it's great, great classic stuff. So uh, that'll Thank do you. it. Yeah, there's actually quite a few things on on YouTube under James Carter Cathcart. I mean, I've put out a few CDs um, over the last few years, and pretty much everything that I've done is up there in one form or another. So that would be great. Sweet. I will have some links to that. All right, everybody. Uh, we'll catch you on the next and I think final uh, Voice October interview this month. And uh, we'll see you in the next one. So uh, in the meantime, smell you later. <laughs> okay, Chris. Thanks for everything.